significant thing when we change the driver's seat of the service. Our scripture te- uh, passage this morning comes to us from 1 Corinthians 15, verses 35 through 44. Actually, all of 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 15 Paul talks about the resurrection. I've only taken half of it uh, to focus on today since it's such a large pass- passage. Paul talks about what happens from our, with the point we die going forward. Listen for God's word. Paul says, Some skeptic is sure to ask, show me how resurrection works. Give me a diagram, draw me a picture. What does this resurrection body look like? If you look at this question closely, you realize how absurd it is. There are no diagrams for this kind of thing. We we do have a parallel experience in gardening. You plant a dead seed, soon there is a flourishing plant. There is no visual likeness between seed and plant. You can never guess what a tomato would look like by looking at a tomato seed. What we plant in the soil and what grows out of it don't look anything alike. The dead body that we bury bury in the ground and the resurrection body that comes from it will be dramatically different. You will notice that the variety of bodies is stunning. Just there are different kinds of seeds, there are different kinds of bodies. Humans, animals, birds, fish, each unprecedented in its form. You get a hint at the diversity of resurrection glory by looking at the diversity of bodies, not only on earth but in the skies, sun, moon, stars, all these variety of beauty and brightness. And we're only looking at pre-resurrection seeds. Who can imagine what the resurrection plants will be like? This image of a planting a dead seed and raising a live plant is a mere sketch at best. But perhaps it will help in approaching the mystery of the resurrection body. But only if you keep in mind that when we're raised, we're raised for good, alive, forever. The corpse that's planted is no beauty. But when it's raised, it's glorious. Put in the ground weak, it comes up powerful. The seed sown is natural. The seed grown is supernatural. Same seed, same body. But what a difference from when it goes down in physical mortality and what it is raised up in spiritual immortality. And here the passage ends. May God bless these words now as we seek to apply them to our lives, here and hereafter. So I have, I have my uh, question I want to lead with today is, what happens after you die? What, what do you believe happens after you die? You know, I, I believe it's really important for us to for all of us to come to some type of understanding about what, it, what we think happens when we die. And, and I love reading all the different world religions and what the different religions believe about what happens when we die. The, the Dharmic religions, uh, uh, Buddhism and Hinduism, Taoism, they believe in a reincarnation. But even they don't have um, one notion about what happens when we die. Uh, the Tibetan Buddhists believe that your body goes through different bardos, different stages that takes them about seven or so days to go through these different bardos. Uh, there are some uh, Buddhists and Hindus and Taoists that believe that your soul stays intact, that it's reincarnated, and that it goes, that, but Steve's soul stays intact as it is reincarnated back into a mushroom. <laughs> Whatever. Um, there are some of those, though, who believe that the soul disperses and that the soul of Steve no longer is Steve, but that it disperses and goes into a mushroom, a caterpillar, a snake, and the president of the United States. <laughs> Again, you know, what do you believe? Do you believe that there is a reincarnation or do you believe that we just have this one particular life? For the most part, Christians believe one of two things that, that happen to us after we die. There are some people who believe, Christians believe, that when you die, that your body and soul stay intact. And that you die and you're put into a casket and you're put into a ground. And that it it stays in the ground until the last trumpet. When Jesus comes again, a trumpet is sound and there is the resurrection of the dead and the bodies and the souls raise up together um, and then the body and soul is judged and then there's a separation. And and this was explained to me as a kid. I always kind of freaked me out a little bit. And and they they said, well, it's just like, you know, when we're driving home from grandma's house. And we have, you know, about a a 45-minute drive, half-hour, 40-minute drive, and you fall asleep. And and before you know it, you wake up, and we're suddenly at home. But there's been this huge distance that has transpired between when you fell asleep and when you woke up. You didn't realize it, that this huge distance, you felt like it was just a moment. Well, that's what happens, they said, you know, when you die and your soul stays together, and the second coming, boom, even though it might have been several hundred years, a century, who knows, it's just like you suddenly wake up. That's why 
caskets are so important. That's also why a lot of Christians who believe this do not believe in, in uh, cremation. Because if you cremate a body, there's nothing to, you know, bring it back. But caskets are so important um, for people who believe this. And, and hermetically sealed caskets, it's really important for these people that they're dressed appropriately, that they're buried with the right type, type of things. And to kind of get us in the mood, I, I found caskets for us. I found a few caskets for us. Uh, I found Mark Johnson's casket. There's a firefighter casket. JJ, JJ, I found your casket. That's very good. I found Mitch's casket. <laughs> and here's my casket. Of course. Yeah, yeah, very good. You know, my, of all the funerals that I've done, you know, and I've done like over 550 funerals, is I, is I went to somebody and, and I walked in and went, there's a camo casket. <laughs> and it had to be really serious, but he was dressed out in camo. He was all ready to hunt in the afterlife, baby. There's a Budweiser casket. There was a Coors casket. Linda Tafoya, I could get you a Coors casket. <laughs> yeah, very cool. Okay, so that's one whole way of viewing what happens to us after we die. Now, actually, you can paste, uh, base it in Scripture. You can go back to Scripture and pr prove this. There's a no whole other perspective about what happens to after we die that Christians believe in, and that is that when we die, that something immediately happens. Immediately happens that the soul lifts up and is raised out of the body. My parents were kind of a split on this. On the one hand, they taught me about this other thing that happens, but then they taught you this prayer. Maybe you learned this prayer. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray this my Lord the soul to take. And that also kind of freaked me out as a kid because you kind of repeat it, repeat it, and sometimes you kind of go, I pray the Lord my soul to take. If I should die before I wake, What's that all about? But then that prayer is about this notion of, you know, when you die, it happens quick. It happens fast in the twinkling of an eye. Um, this also is present in the New Testament, especially in Paul. We'll get to that in a moment. But when Jesus is on the cross and there are uh, two thieves that are crucified with him on his right and his left, he says to one of them, today you will be with me in paradise. Not not in a gajillion years when I come back, but today, in this moment, you'll be with me in paradise. So what do you believe? What do you believe about what happens to you after you die? See, that's what I love about the sermon series. The sermon series on the end of Jesus, competing stories of Jesus' past and future. It's giving Jess and I a marvelous opportunity to cover some ground with you that we rarely get to cover. And I know that it's controversial, it's kind of unnerving and disturbing for a lot of folks, but I'm finding it a lot of fun. Because I'm kind of get to challenge some of the core uh, kind of latent beliefs that people have, and I'm hopefully able to open up new ideas for you. And if you were here last Sunday, you kind of uh, saw what I did as far as the whole historical um, underpinning, if you will, of the New Testament, because what I hope to is by Easter Sunday to help you come to a whole new understanding of the resurrection so that when we really celebrate what this big thing is, you will know what it means for you. Or at least you'll begin to know what it means for you. Because what I'm doing to you, what I'm doing with you now, I'm only sharing with you my thoughts. I'm sharing, you with what I, sharing with you what I've learned, what I believe to be true. You know what? That ain't going to get you into heaven. You've got to figure it out. You have to wrestle with these things. And I'm hoping today to present to you a few more things for you to wrestle with. So let's first of all talk about this term resurrection. We talk about the resurrection quite a bit. What is this term resurrection? It, the best thing that for me that I can use to describe it is the sense of explosion, transformational explosion. When we think about resurrection, we usually associate it with something that happens when we die. And that's a good place to start, the hereafter. That it is such this grand thing that happens that it, when we die, something happens and it transforms us going forward. The, this power of God, boom, moves forward and transforms our hereafter. But that's just really one part of it. Really, the, the, the Bible is very, very clear that it goes not only into the hereafter, but to the here. What it is that's happening in your life right now. And so that this whole notion, this big, huge something that transforms our hereafter, goes this direction and transforms our here, your life. 
the issues that you're dealing with now in your life, the relationships that you have now in your life. And this transformational power of God is moving right here in your life. So when we talk about the resurrection, it goes both ways, here and hereafter. Now the first person to really wrestle with this is the Apostle Paul. Now if you were here last Sunday, you saw what I did with this human timeline, where we had J.J. standing up here as Jesus. And by the way, you just did an astounding job. You make a really good Jesus. <laughs> so we had, you know, remember, so we had, we had Jesus here. Now, watch what I do here. Watch what I'm going to say here. Because this is actually the most controversial thing that many of you said that I've said. Uh, I think I said that right. Um, back in September, and, and, I, and I'm not the one who's made this up. I've thought about this for years, but when I started seeing other scholars say the same thing, and I'm like, yes, I'm on the right track. I do not believe that the historical Jesus, the guy who walked, I said this back in September, the guy who walked, the illiterate, theological, peasant, savant. Theological savant. All right? I didn't say that right. Illiterate, peasant, theological savant. That's it. I do not believe that he thought he was sent here to the world to die for our sins, as a sacrifice for our sins. I believe that he thought that he was here to wake us up to the presence of God, to wake us up to the immediate presence of God, he woke us up to say that you don't have to go to the temple to experience God. God is here immediately with you. Um, he said, I have come that my joy might be with you and that your joy might be full. It's about joy and love and compassion. That's what I believe the historical Jesus talked about. Then if you remember the human timeline, we had the Q source, right, that kind of traveled. And, the, and this is about 30, 35, right? Uh, 30, 33, 35, around there. And, about, and I have the Apostle Paul standing right here in about 35 to 40-ish. The Apostle Paul, who was persecuting the early Christians after the resurrection, the Apostle Paul standing right here is the first one who began to wrestle with what is the effect that the crucifixion had on our lives. And the Apostle Paul, as a Pharisee who was persecuting the church, he had an amazing experience where he said he met the resurrected Lord. Now here's a, kind of an interesting footnote. Here's a bend. Hang with me on this because it's kind of a bend for a lot of people. If you've been to Sunday school a lot in your life, you know that this is called the, the Damascus Road experience, where he was on the road to Damascus because he was going to go arrest a bunch of, of Christians and bring them back and have them tried and possibly executed. And, and as he's going down the road to Damascus, that he has this, this big light, and it struck him down and made him blind. It's a powerful story. Paul, as he wrote his letters, never once describes this. Never once describes this. It is Luke. Remember, I had Matthew and Luke down here about 50 years after Paul, who writes this as a gospel. Paul has since died and has become a folk hero within Christianity. And they are the ones who tell this amazing... He, the author of Luke Acts is the one who tells this amazing story about the folk hero. Did it actually happen that way? See, again, I said... As I said last year, there's a lot of Christians who believe it because the Holy Spirit inspired the author of Luke Acts that this is the way it happened. Some people believe that. I don't. Because it's never mentioned in this whole body of material that he writes. First and second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians, uh, Cl no, Ephesians, Colossians, not, uh, those are non Pauline material, but that's something else I'm going to get into later. Um, Romans. He never talks about it. Instead, he talks about this experience that he had with the resurrected Lord, the resurrected Jesus. And ever since he has this mystical experience where he says that Jesus, he does this in 1 Corinthians, Jesus appeared to him. And he wrestled then with, well, what does this mean? The story for him is not important. What's important is what does this mean? And Paul was the first one who wrestled with this whole notion of what does this mean. Now, another footnote about Paul. Paul is a Pharisee. The Pharisees developed, and I grab my Bible right here, developed in what we call the intertestamental time frame. And I'm giving you a lot of material today. This is, I, need, I know that you all had to wake up an hour early, but you need to stay awake. 
This is, this is kind of like a college lecture today. There is a, a space between the Old Testament and the New Testament. We just like flip a page and we think we go from the Old Testament to New Testament. Well, actually, in between this, these two pages, there's about 400 years of history that we call the intertestamental time period. All right? In this intertestamental time period, the Pharisees, as a group of Jewish religious scholars, developed after they came back from the Babylonian exile. It was the Pharisees who developed the concept of resurrection. Before the Pharisees in the Old Testament, there is no concept of life after death like the resurrection as we think about it. It was the Pharisees who developed the concept and brought it into the Jewish tradition. Where, where did they get their, their understanding of it? We, we believe that it came either from the Babylonians or from the Egyptians. The Babylonians had a concept of the resurrection, and we definitely know the Egyptians did. The Egyptians had a concept of the resurrection for, gosh, centuries uh, that predated uh, Judaism and Christianity, or especially Christianity and Judaism. So they were influenced, and somehow the Pharisees brought it into uh, the thinking of the Jewish people so that Paul, the resurrection, became the glasses that Paul is using to understand the life of Jesus. Everybody tracking? So then you have to ask yourself, so what does it mean for, Jesus, for Paul that he says that Jesus was resurrected? What Paul is basically saying is that it is God's action. The resurrection is God's action in Jesus' life. That it was God who raised Jesus up. It wasn't Jesus who raised Jesus up, it was God who raised Jesus up. And what he's trying to say is that, that Jesus was such the example of the fullness of humanity that God raised him up as a way of saying this is the ultimate life. This is the ultimate being. If you want to live a godly life, you want, if you want to live the way I want you to live, I want you to live as Jesus lived. So that it was God's action in Jesus' life. And then Paul, then it goes in two directions. Then it goes in two directions. Paul says, first of all, let's talk about the effect on the here. It is Paul now living here with the concept of resurrection as a Pharisee who looks back and says, it is as if he died for our sins. And it's really important for you to know that Paul doesn't actually say it that way. I say it that way with emphasis. Paul is a Pharisee. He's very aware of what happens in the temple. For you to have your sins forgiven... You have to go to the temple and sacrifice an animal, depending upon the sin that you have, you know, committed. It's either, you know, a cereal offering, a dove, a, a, a ram, a bull, depending upon where you are, your socioeconomic perspective in society. And you were constantly having to go to the temple to sacrifice because you're constantly polluted. Paul's going, no, no. Jesus, from this point in history, he's looking back and he says, perfect sacrifice. It is as if perfect sacrifice. And he is the one that because of his life and because of his death, we are completely cleansed of our sins. We are new creations, says Paul. Now, many, many Christians take that literally. And I understand that. that, that that's, that's good. That's okay. For me, I don't take that literally. I take that metaphorically. Because I do not believe that, because I don't believe that God sent Jesus to, as a sacrifice, because a lot of people have said, well, why, didn't, why does God require like a, the death of his son? Why couldn't he just like forgive us? And well, yeah, that's true. But in, as a first century Pharisee, that makes more sense. Because he's always going to the temple sacrificing. And suddenly he's freed from that. Now, metaphorically, for me, it's just as powerful. Because what it means is for us to think about what is it in your life that you're chained to? Where in your life do you feel broken? Where in your life is there pain? Where in your life do you feel a separation 
between you and God. See, what Paul says is, is it's, it's not there. You are not separate from God. Through the resurrection, the crucifixion, the resurrection of Jesus, you have been forgiven. You are free. Be free of this. That, for me, is what it means to know that Jesus has died for my sins. When people ask me, do you believe that Jesus died for your sins? I go, yeah. Knowing in my own brain what I mean by that. Then I am freed from the guilt and the burden and the pain of the screw-ups that I've made in my life. That's the here. And then there's the hereafter. That's the passage what, that I read this morning. Because uh, the first part of 1 Corinthians deals with all of this. The second, 1 Corinthians 15 deals with all this. The second part of 1 Corinthians 15 deals with this. He says, what does a resurrected body look like? He said, eventually someone's going to ask me, what does a resurrected body look like? For Paul, this is a spiritual aspect. It is a transformation. He talks about the body as being this perishable thing, a warehouse of the soul, that when it's planted in the ground, it's dead and forgotten. And it has to go into the ground. And he uses the analogy of planting a seed. He says like planting a seed. You put it into the ground, the seed dies, and when it comes up out of the ground, it looks completely different than the seed that went into the ground. He uses the analogy in, a, in the, the translation I use called the message of a tomato seed. He said, look at the tomato seed. He said, it doesn't look anything like a tomato. You plant it in the ground, it dies, but out of it comes this great big plant. He said, that's kind of what happens in the resurrection. Your body goes down into the ground. What comes out of it is something completely other. There's not a physical body that comes out. It's something completely other. See, now I want to kind of work on this point for a few moments. Because a lot of people, when we think about the resurrection, we think about what I will call a resuscitated corpse. You know, to use the analogy of, of I like the, the silkworm. What happens to a silkworm? When we think about resurrection, we think about, like, a silkworm is us. The silkworm spins a cocoon. And a lot of us, then, when we think about resurrection, we think, ah, the body comes back. Silkworm. No, that's not it. That's what happened to Lazarus in John's gospel. You know, when, when, when Lazarus had been dead for three days and, and Jesus stood outside of the tomb and said, Lazarus, come out! And he came out wrapped in his uh, linen wrappings. That was silkworm, cocoon, silkworm. I, I couldn't find a good picture of Lazarus uh, but I did find a really good picture of Damien, Damien Mulvaney coming out of a tomb. This is what you're supposed to laugh. That's a joke. We were in Israel. Oh, you really can't see it. Oh, on my screen, you can see it. That, uh, that's, we were in Israel, and they have these tombs. I had a Damien, come out of the tomb. Can you hit the lights? Can you hit my side lights? It might be hard to do so you, so you can kind of see it. Oh, there you can kind of see him now. If Damien were to die and come out of the tomb, that's a silkworm. That's a resuscitation of a corpse. Can you not see that? You kind of stand, okay, I'll move on. All right. <laughs> Lights. Good. Okay. What resurrection is, is silkworm, cocoon, monarch butterfly. That's resurrection. What Paul is talking about when you die, he says it happens in a twinkling of an eye. A twinkling of an eye. Something happens in your body and you become monarch butterfly. My favorite uh, study of this was done in 1907 by Dr. Duncan McDougall, who was working in a hospital um, I want to say leukemia, but I know it's not leukemia, but I can't come up with the right disease. Uh, it's, it's absent from me. But he was a doctor where these hundreds of people were dying. And the more he was watching people who died, he said, there's something that happens at the moment of death. There's something that happens at the moment of death. And so he created a bed with scales underneath it, weights, you know. And he put dying people on the bed, and the doctors around watched bodies die and watched the scales, what happened to the scales. 
and about an ounce changed. Repeatedly, an ounce. Now, I know some of you are medical doctors out there, and you kind of go, oh, come on, Steve, that's just the body relaxed, the muscles did this, the body exhaled, da 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 Probably a good medical answer to that. See, theologically, I go, no, 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 baby, I've seen that ounce. <laughs> I've seen that ounce. You know, I have watched... Hundreds and hundreds of people die. I see several of you shaking your heads. You have watched your loved one die. You have watched your spouse die. You have watched your children die. You have watched your grandparents die. You have watched your parents die. You have seen that ounce. I saw that. Literally, this, this. When Kathy Berenberg's dad died, um, Kathy, who sings with us, there was uh, several years ago, it was an uh, Easter Eve, I'll never forget, I was working on my Easter uh, sermon, and Kathy calls, Steve, my dad's at Littleton Hospital, um, he's trying to die, he's kind of stuck, can you come? I said, sure, absolutely. And so actually, uh, many of you know Rebecca kemper Poos, associate pastor at the time, we both uh, call her Rebecca, let's go down. I thought to myself, gosh, it's Easter Eve, I've got to be doing my sermon, but I said, well, maybe this is more important. Um, so I went down to the hospital, and sure enough, he's right there, and we stayed and stayed and prayed and tried to hook into with him. Something I'm kind of able to do is hook into people, get into their spiritual plane, and help them kind of let go. And sure enough, we gathered around the bed. I said, I think it's coming, and he died. And as everybody was looking here at the bed, I literally saw this. He sat up. He looked around. He looked at me, swung his legs over the edge of the bed, got up, looked back at the family, and walked out of the room. I went. I hit Rebecca. Rebecca, did you just see that? Shh. No, no, no. Shh. Everybody was, was focused this direction. But I know what I saw. I know what I saw. I saw this saw this. I, I saw it a few other times as well. You talk with people who are hospice nurses, people around death a lot, they will tell you, yeah, yeah. They see this, they feel it. If you only have kind of a brush with death every once in a while, and that's what the majority of people, you only kind of see death every once in a while. I see death every week. Hospice nurses see death every day. I know you, I can tell you what I believe happens. It is a, Paul de- describes it a transformation. It happens in a twinkling of an eye. So, what does this mean for all of us? Oh, not yet. One more slide. This is really important. Back to the socio historical before I get to what it means. So here's Paul, right here. Paul is the yellow s- picture of the, the soul raising up. Transformation is a spiritual thing that happens, not a bodily thing. The body dies, goes into the ground, and in the twinkling of an eye, it raises up. The other picture is actually all the way over here. Remember when I had John's gospel? And I, I, last week I had John standing way over here, near the end of the century, about 60, 70, 80 years after the guy Jesus and about 50 years, 60 years after the Apostle Paul, uh, John describes Jesus' resurrection as a physical bodily thing. And this painting is of Thomas, doubting Thomas, where Jesus pulls back his robe and says, says, Thomas, here, put your hand in my side where the Roman centurion speared me. Touch my hands. Uh, Jesus, the resurrected Jesus over there, has breakfast on the beach. He, he actually has, uh, puts food in his mouth. The point being is look at the, at, the, at the transformation through history. At this point, close to Jesus, 10, 15 years, Paul views it as a spiritual resurrection. When we get to Matthew, Mark, Matthew, and Luke, 
Next week I'll talk quickly about Mark and then Matthew and Luke and then to John, then Easter. It's a physical resurrection. What do you believe? Now, what does this mean for us? What does this mean for us? For me, I always start with the here. Here, in the midst of your life. What are you dealing with? You know, I, I really believe it's the common denominator. It's the leveler of all of humanity. From me to you to everybody, we all got junk. We all have a mess. Human beings are messy creations. We're all a mess. We all try to look good and look nice and whatnot, but I've always found you set someone down, I kind of scratch just the surface, and there's the junk. Scratch my service, and it's just not junk. There's a garbage dump. We all got it. And we hate it. You know, because it'd be like that, that stuff. Man, if anybody found out I was like this, they would not want me to be their friend. They would not want me to be their minister. The Apostle Paul hated his junk. He, he writes that three times he cried out to God, God, take this junk out of my life. God says, nope, not doing it. Paul says, why? God says, because my power is going to be made perfect through your weakness. See, and how I come to understand it is that through that junk, one, it keeps us humble and keeps us tied into the fact that we are dependent upon grace. You can't be good enough to be loved by God. It's, it's freely given. And by the mere fact that your junk does not go away reminds you that you are always, every single day, in needing to be forgiven, and every single day, you are forgiven. You are basked in love. And that's why I hate the junk, but I love the junk. I hate the junk because I'm embarrassed of it. I love the junk because I'm reminded, God, you love me. Forgive me. Do you want to call it that Jesus died for your sins as a sacrifice? That works for me. Most important thing is knowing I'm loved. <coughs> you are loved. Resurrection. Here. Hereafter. What do you believe? Someday, someday. I don't know if you can see that, that the button up there that says play. God's going to push that button. And your show is going to be about to be begun. What's that show going to look like? You know, do you know what I hope my dying words are when my button is played? Here's what I hope my dying words are. And now I find out. Let's pray. Loving God, your power moves through the creation. It is such an amazing power that on the one hand, it blasts away the chains of death. And on the other hand, it's tender and is with us in the most hard times of our life. And we're grateful for your mercy and kindness, especially when we feel messy. And we know that we have screwed up. So thank you, O oh God, for that grace. Thank you for the teachings of your son. We thank you for people like the Apostle Paul who really wrestled with what does this mean. We're grateful for Christians down through the ages who have tried their best to figure out what this means and have shared their thoughts with each other. But God, really what you care about is what we as individuals believe. And so God, I pray that your spirit works in their hearts, in my heart. So we're constantly trying to put it together. What does this mean? What does this mean that you love us? What does this mean that we are changed and transformed? What does this mean? So that when it comes to the point in our lives where we stand, at that moment when the hereafter begins, we do so with all the courage in the world. 
because we know that we are not alone because you are there waiting to greet us, to welcome us home. So God, all this great theology comes all the way back to your son who was so simple in what he taught us. I think he would have been put off by all this theology because he said it's just about living in your great love and grace. The disciples knew that. And so one day they sat and they said, Jesus, teach us how to pray. And what he taught them wasn't a long, lengthy thing, but it was short, sweet, and to the point. And so let us now join together in singing that prayer. Would the ushers please come forward to receive this morning's offer?